All right, everybody, let's get back to our study of Matthew. Um, if you've been with us through the first couple of videos, we've done the first couple of chapters of the study of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And today I want to see if I can cover chapters 3 and 4 with you. I know I said the last two times that I was going to cover two chapters and didn't quite get there, but I think even if it takes a little extra time, I'm going to go ahead and try to cover chapters 3 and 4. Uh, so if you're ready, let's get started. Um, hopefully you have a Bible available. If not, uh, then just listen along and let's be encouraged. Let's learn and grow in our faith and understanding and love and the hope we have in Jesus as our Savior. In Matthew chapter 1, remember we started uh, Matthew showing us the genealogy of Jesus, showing that he descended from Abraham and David. We then looked at the birth of Jesus, Jesus being born of a virgin uh, whose mother was Mary. And so we saw that prophecy fulfilled of the virgin birth. Then in chapter 2, uh, we had the visit of the wise men. And then we, in, in the chapter 2, actually, we had four more prophecies fulfilled uh, surrounding Jesus um, and what took place around or after, rather, the birth of Jesus. And so we had, uh, so far, um, in Matthew, we've seen a total of five prophecies fulfilled um, by Jesus. Uh, we looked at how Herod, uh, Herod tried to destroy Jesus uh, to destroy the Christ, the chosen one, um, but it didn't work because God uh, had Joseph and Mary and Jesus run away to Egypt and stay there in Egypt until Herod was dead. Uh, they finally come back after the death of Herod, um, but because Herod's son has now become king, uh, they end up going up into Galilee and then living in Nazareth uh, that small nothing of a town, really, probably much like my hometown. Um, I'm from uh, Trenton, Florida. I'm from a one traffic light town. I uh, love that town to death. To me, that town is wonderful. I mean, that's my home, but, you know, on the grand map of the world, um, it's really not much to talk about in many people's eyes, and that's Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth was not much to talk about. Um, and so we're going to see that come up time and time again, why many even doubted Jesus being the Christ, uh, partly because um, even as is said one time, um, even as one of Jesus's later apostles would say, um, you know, before he became an apostle, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so we'll see that later on. But let's begin in chapter 3, in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Here Matthew <clears throat> shows John the Baptist um, who came ahead of Jesus um, to prepare the way of Jesus. And we see that John the Baptist was a chosen messenger, the chosen messenger to prepare the way of Jesus. And that's how uh, Matthew begins his talk about John the Baptist when he says that in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Um, and so John was there, he was out in the wilderness, he was not in the towns, not um, in public places, he rather stayed out in the wilderness, excuse me, and that is where he was doing his preaching and teaching, saying, and his message was this, verse 2, repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, that is, the kingdom that God was bringing in. Through the Messiah, through the Christ, John said it is at hand, it is ready, it is coming soon. Not in some far later time, not thousands of years later. John said the kingdom of heaven is at hand because, again, he's preparing the way for the Messiah, for Jesus to come and to establish that kingdom. Recently at the Zephyr Hills Church of Christ, we've been studying about um, the doctrine or the teaching of men about premillennialism. Um, and we have been studying into that, and we have been looking at whether premillennialism uh, matches up with God's Word. And so far, obviously, uh, we have found that it does not. And one of the things, this is one of the keys, that um, when it talks about the kingdom that Christ, the Messiah, was to be bringing, 
Um, those who believe in premillennialism want to make the kingdom something that uh, Jesus did not establish, Jesus did not bring in, and is not something in their belief that will come until much, much later. But if we read passages like this and we read through the gospel, and even as John the Baptist was saying that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it is ready, it is coming, it is soon, it is close, get ready now, he says. And we see later on that Jesus would establish that kingdom within the church. Um, and so we'll talk more about that as we continue studies later on. But what's said of John the Baptist in verse 3 uh, there is, for this is he of who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, when Isaiah said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That is prophecy number six that is fulfilled um, here in the lifetime of Jesus. Now, yes, this prophecy is fulfilled by John the Baptist, but it is in reference to the work and life and the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, and Christ. And so that is one more prophecy that Matthew shows fulfilled, that of John the Baptist being the one to come prepare the way, the one who would come in the spirit of Elijah. And I'm going to tell you now, um, this is getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, um, that the Gospels point out, or Jesus will show, um, that John the Baptist was also the one prophesied to be Elijah coming. Um, there was a prophecy made, um, and I believe in Malachi, at the end of Malachi, about the one who would come, that Elijah would return and come back. Um, but it wasn't literally Elijah coming, um, but rather John the Baptist is the one who fulfilled that prophecy, as Jesus himself will later say. Now let's look at what it said about John the Baptist, beginning in verse 4. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food, get this, it was locusts and wild honey. Uh, no thanks. I am on a diet myself, or at least a life change. I'm trying to eat healthy. Uh, honey I could do, but locusts, eh, not so much. Um, I guess unless I could take the locusts and blend them up in a shake, which... That sounds pretty disgusting, but nevertheless, uh, I'm going to pass on that. But John, John the Baptist, out in the wilderness, um, you know, he ain't dressed fancy. He's uh, not eating fancy. He's just, he's a man, if you will, of basic uh, minimal means. Um, nothing to show, nothing to show off, uh, nothing fancy about him. Very simplistic life. Um, and so he is keeping it simple and keeping it real with the people out in the wilderness as they come to him, which we are told in verse 5, that then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan River were going out to John, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And so, um, as we're told, John was out there preaching about repenting for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And many people were coming to John the Baptist and were confessing their sins, repenting of their sins. And we are told in another gospel that this baptism that John was performing, that when people were coming and confessing their sins, repenting of their sins and being baptized in John's baptism was a means of forgiveness at this time. Now, Matthew doesn't point that out, um, but there in another gospel it is pointed out, it is said that it was for the forgiveness of sins for these people at this time, uh, between, if you will, between the law of Moses and then the cross of Christ. And so we see that um, played out in um, John's baptism as well. But verse 7, what happens is as a bunch of people are, you know, coming out to John and they're repenting of their sins, confessing their sins, being baptized. Well, then look who shows up on the scene in verse 7. That he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, two different groups of the Jews who had uh, different, some different beliefs and different standards. Uh, one of the ones that stuck out the most, of course, is the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Um, and that's just one difference among them, and a very big one. Uh, but they came to John's baptism. But uh, John was, he wasn't, he wasn't, I can't talk. John was no dummy. 
Um, he knew, and maybe in part, um, you know, by the help of the Holy Spirit, or maybe he just was really that smart, that he knew, he knew that these particular Jews were not actually coming to sincerely confess and repent of their sins. And so he calls them out on it. He says, you brood of vipers. He calls them a bunch of snakes. He says, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, he says. So basically what John is charging them with is their lack of sincerity. He's telling them, don't come here and to be baptized by me, pretending like you're really coming to repent of your sins and change your life, that you really want to change and have forgiveness. No, he says, you've got to prove it. And how you prove it, that you're truly sincere in your repentance, is you bear fruits in keeping with repentance. That means you actually show by your actions, not just in word, not just in saying that you repent, but actually showing by your life, in your actions, that you really are going to change. And so John lays it on them. John says, listen, folks, you need to be sincere in this. This isn't a game. This isn't a joke. Um, you need to come here for the right reasons. He then uh, says to them in verses 9 and 10, he says, do not presume to say to yourselves, don't think that you can just say, well, we have Abraham as our father." You know, big whoop de doo We are descendants of Abraham, and so we get a pass. We're good. We're better than everybody else. We're safe, and we can do whatever we want. No. He says, for I tell you, God is able from these stones, from a bunch of rocks, to raise up children for Abraham. So basically, John says, don't come here trying to claim, you know, Abraham as your father and how that some, somehow gives you a pass and you don't really have to change your life because if that's the case then God's going to reject you and God will just he could raise up children for Abraham from a bunch of rocks and then he says verse 10 that even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire and so another analogy he gives another picture of a tree that God is looking for trees to bear fruit. What fruit? Fruits of righteousness. And John basically flat out says, God is going to accept those trees that bear fruit, but the trees that do not bear fruits of righteousness, the trees that do not repent and change their lives and live in the righteousness of God are going to be cut down and destroyed. He then says in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one, he who is coming after me, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not to, I am not worthy to carry, he says. He, that is the one coming, that is Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that is something we see fulfilled, to jump ahead again, on the day of Pentecost. When they are literally, when the apostles would literally be uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit coming upon them, tongues as a fire above, their, above them. And so that is something that John said was going to happen. He then says again in verse 12, that his winnowing forth, that is, of the Messiah, of Jesus. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That is the fruit, or rather, in this case, the wheat, the produce, the crop is going that is going to be acceptable to the Messiah, to God, is going to be that which bears fruit the fruit of righteousness, or yields a crop of righteousness, but the chaff, the chaff that is not crop, it, it has no sustenance, it, it, it is to be burned and thrown away. That's what's going to happen to those who do not repent and come to God and change their life. And so John clearly proclaims the message of the kingdom of heaven, which is one of repentance, that we have to turn away from sin, and sincerely 
do our very best to change our life. Because we can't expect to receive the grace of God if we don't really change our way of living. That's not how the grace of God works. The grace of God is not a free pass or a free get out of jail free card. Every time, you know, we want to go do what we want to do. We've got to actually bear fruit in keeping with repentance if we want to be part of God's kingdom and to receive his grace. And so that is the message that John was giving to the people. Well, then verse 13, who shows up then? None other than Jesus himself. The one that John has been pointing to, or will point to, as the Messiah, as the Christ. That Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. But John, much like we, at least in our understanding, we on this side of the cross and having the gospel explained, we know Jesus was sinless. Why did Jesus go to John to be baptized? And that's what John wants to know. John, we're told that when Jesus came to be baptized by John, that John would have prevented Jesus saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? I mean, John was shocked. He says, you know, wait, you know, I need to be, I need you to baptize me and not the other way around. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus answered him and said, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John agreed to baptize Jesus. And we still question, wonder, why was Jesus baptized? Why was Jesus baptized? He didn't have anything to repent of. He didn't have any sins that needed forgiving. But he said it himself, I think, simply enough to fulfill all righteousness that Jesus was doing what everybody else was required to do, to be baptized by John. And so Jesus did that. He did the will of God, whatever, whether it was the law of Moses as a Jew or whether it was the baptism of John. But what we also know about the baptism of John Uh, or when Jesus came to be baptized by John, it was also when Jesus received the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit, after Jesus was baptized and when Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. Yes, in the form of a dove. And we wonder a lot about the Holy Spirit and who he is and why he did this and so on and so forth. And I actually, in in, uh, the future, um, I want to do some more in-depth studies about the Holy Spirit to understand who he is, to understand that he is part of the Godhead, to understand what he has done and what he does do, at least as revealed from God's word. But that's going to come at a later time. And we'll refer back to this text when we do get to that study one day. But he comes and he rests upon Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus. And then we hear the voice of the Father from heaven that this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. That voice from heaven, God the Father, proclaiming Jesus as his Son, in whom he was well pleased. What an amazing thing Jesus does and shows an example for us to follow in all faith and obedience and all that God tells us to do. And so that is one example we have of what Jesus does here for us to learn from as well. All right, so chapter 3, we saw John the Baptist and the work he was doing, preparing the way for Jesus, for the kingdom of heaven to come in, for Jesus to establish his kingdom and for the people to receive the kingdom. And so that is what John does. And then Jesus is baptized. He receives the Holy Spirit. And now it is time and Jesus is ready to begin his ministry and work. But before he does, there's something that Jesus does go and do 
right after his baptism. And that's where we get into chapter 4 in this next section. So let's begin in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 now. That it was after, right after the baptism of Jesus, as the other Gospels tell us, that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. So the Spirit, immediately after Jesus' baptism, the Spirit takes Jesus, leads him into the wilderness by himself. For what reason? Well, we're told to be tempted by the devil. Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, to be tested, to be tried, to be, uh, again, tempted by the Holy Spirit. And so we are told in Matthew's account, the way Matthew tells it, the way he puts it, is that after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, guess what? Go figure. Can you believe this? After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was what? Hungry. Yeah, you think? I mean, I, I have a hard enough time fasting for three hours without getting really hungry, getting hangry, as we like to say nowadays. And so Jesus was hungry. Well, this is a prime opportunity. This is when the tempter, when Satan comes in to tempt Jesus, and we are told, beginning in verse 3, that the tempter came. The tempter comes and says to Jesus, or says to him, if you are the Son of God, as he's claiming to be, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Well, why would Satan have chosen bread? Because Jesus was hungry. So, G or, uh, so Satan wants to test Jesus to say, you know, if you really think, if you really are the Son of God, then prove it by just turning some stones into bread so that you can eat, because obviously you're hungry. That would have been me for me. That would have been a big temptation, and I'm sure it was for Jesus. I mean, starving as he was, hurting as he was, hungry as he was, knowing that he had the Holy Spirit, he had the power of God with him, knowing that he could have certainly turned stones into bread. It would have been very tempting, but what did he do? Jesus instead answers him in verse 4 and says, It is written. Written where? It's written in the word of God, in the law of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The words of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that's how Jesus overcame that temptation, is by trusting in God, having faith in God, and following the word of God. And he was combating and counteracting Satan with the word of God. Well then, next, okay, that didn't work, so the devil takes him into the holy city and sets him on the pinnacle of of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, then throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Ah, well now that, that trickster, much as he did, well, he didn't really do that in the very beginning in the garden. Uh, he really twisted more than he quoted, which he's misquoting this, or at least his intentions are wrong. Here, he, he is using scripture. He tells Jesus, okay, well, if you want to throw scripture at me, well, here's some scripture for you. Well, it is said that of the Christ, of the anointed one, of the Messiah, of the Son of God, that God will command his angels concerning you and that he will protect you from harm. And so if you really are the Son of God, then you know, just jump off the temple and God will send his angels, and they will not let you hit the ground and die. Well, tempting, because Jesus could have done it to show his power. But Jesus said to him, again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus tells him, it's written. God's word. You don't test God. You, 
don't try me like this, Satan. This ain't going to work, and I'm not doing it. And so he again rejects Satan's offer. Well, finally, verse 8, the devil then takes him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So now Satan is promising Jesus glory and power and wealth and reward in this physical world. If Jesus would bow down and worship Satan instead of worshiping God. Again, what's tempting about that is the immediate uh, reward, the immediate... Um, you know, the, that lust of the eyes and flesh and pride of life, of power and wealth and glory and kingdom. But Jesus wasn't going to have it. And so Jesus says to him, finally here in verse 10, he's had enough. He says, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, again Jesus turns to the word of God, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Only God. I'm not going to worship Satan, not going to worship idols, not going to worship anybody else but God. And it's then that the devil leaves Jesus. And actually what we're told in another gospel, um, and the account of this, is that the, the devil didn't just leave Jesus alone. The devil left him alone until another opportune time to come at Jesus. And that's how Satan works. Is Satan is always waiting for an opportune time for a door to be opened. He is waiting. He is crouching. He is ready to pounce. And so we've got to be very careful that we don't give him those opportunities. And especially don't make those opportunities very easy. But then notice that after the devil leaves Jesus, behold, angels come to Jesus and were ministering to him. And for good reason. I mean, he had been suffering out in the wilderness. He had been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He needed special attention and help and care and nourishment, the kind, obviously, that only angels could give to really help Jesus and take care of him in this weakened physical state. And so we see the temptation of Jesus. But Jesus passed the test with flying colors. A good example for us and how we are going to defeat Satan and overcome temptation as well. We need to come to this often and to see what Jesus did and remind ourselves of what we need to do when faced with temptation. All right, well then in, in verse 12, Jesus, then later on, we're not told how much long after, but Jesus, when he heard that John had been arrested, John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus then withdrew into Galilee. And we remember from another gospel account um, that John was arrested um, because he taught some things that uh, the king didn't like uh, about his marriage. And so... Um, John the Baptist was arrested and would eventually be executed, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but when Jesus heard that, Jesus goes into Galilee and leaving Nazareth then, he actually goes and lives in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. And it is here that another prophecy is now fulfilled. Um, that it says, so Jesus went in, in to the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled that says this, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them a light has dawned. Jesus is the light of the world. He is that light that has now come into their very presence. 
to bring the light of life. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus now picks up his ministry, picks up after John is arrested. Jesus is now the messenger of repentance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is then in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 4 that while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is also called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, who were casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, um, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed Jesus. And so here we have, at least as recorded for us, the first four disciples that Jesus specifically chose to come and follow him, all being fishermen with the intent, as he told Peter and Andrew, that Jesus was going to turn these fishermen into fishers of men. He was going to turn them into spiritual fishers, workers for the kingdom of heaven. Well then, in the final part of chapter 4, we are told, beginning in verse 23, that Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. And not only was he teaching and proclaiming the gospel, he was then healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Jesus began performing miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit in him. Jesus was working great wonders and miracles and at this time healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And so, rightly so, the fame of Jesus spread throughout all Syria and they brought Jesus all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those even oppressed by demons epileptics and paralytics and Jesus healed them all. He healed those who were sick and suffering. He cast out demons. The amazing, wonderful power and grace and love of God. We're not quite there yet. We'll see later on. But why was Jesus performing? Well, Jesus wasn't just doing these miracles out of the goodness of his heart, just because. These miracles were meant, yes, to be a blessing to the people at that time, but more importantly and mostly, they were intended to show the authority of Jesus, to show and to prove that Jesus truly was sent by God, that God is the Father of Jesus, or God the Father is the Father of Jesus. And so the people could truly believe and have faith that what he was doing, what he was teaching, was true, and that they should follow him as the Messiah in Christ who he was. And so we are told, verse 25, that great crowds began to follow Jesus from Galilee and the the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And so as Jesus' fame began to spread, more and more people came to follow him, to hear his teachings, to see his miracles. What a blessing that must have been. Well, we're going to go ahead and stop there for today. And tomorrow, Lord willing, if we're given tomorrow, What we're going to do is we're actually going to start in chapter 5 of Matthew. And what we find there is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And there is a lot going on in the Sermon on the Mount. So we'll see. We'll cover it as we can, see where we get to. Uh, But that's what's coming next, uh, starting tomorrow. We're going to get into the Sermon on the Mount, which is full of so many important lessons that Jesus will give. 
All right, God bless. Continue to grow in the faith. Continue to grow in God's Word, and I enjoy spending this time with you. I hope this is beneficial to you and encouraging, and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow, Lord willing, to spend more time together in God's Word. Take care. Love you all. Bye-bye.